Hi, everybody, and welcome back to Miss Angler's biology class. I am Miss Angler. In today's video, we are going to be looking at a past paper exam question on natural selection, and this one is definitely a hard question. I say that because it requires mostly application knowledge, and it requires you to synthesize new answers that you may have not ever given before because you have to apply your knowledge to this new situation about natural selection. Now, if you are new here, don't forget to give this video a thumbs up and make sure you subscribe because I post every Tuesday and Thursday. And if you'd like to pause the video now and try the question first before we begin, then do so. And then we're going to go through how to unpack this question and then I will give you the memo as well so you can mark your answers and see exactly where the marks were allocated. Also, if you are on matric, don't forget that you can get a copy of my study guide, the cheat sheet, which is available on my website, missangler.co.za. But if you are a YouTube member on my membership page, then you get access to my study guide for free. And it really does make the studying process that much easier. It simplifies everything and it gives you so many tips and tricks to getting full marks in your final exams. So let's now break down this natural selection question. First off, it starts off by saying that finches uh, of the species Geospeza fortis are found on one of the Galapagos Islands, and there was variation in their size of beaks, so we can already see an indication of natural selection. All the finches were used to feeding on small, soft seeds, which were plentiful on the island. Then the island was affected by a severe drought, which made the food scarce. Many of the plants on the island died, and the small soft seeds were all gone. Only the hard, woody seeds remained. Now, scientists conducted an investigation, and now we must highlight the sentence because it's going to tell us the aim and reveal some important answers to determine the relationship between beak size and survival of finches during, uh, sorry, before and during a drought. Now, that, that bit there I've highlighted is the aim of this experiment, and it's often important to find the aim because it gives you all your variables and answers you may need for later on questions. Now, below that, we have a table showing our results. We've got beak size, we've got total number of finches before the drought, and then total number of finches during the drought. Now, before we unpack any of the questions, remember to spend some time looking at the table and making sure we can see the trend or the relationship between beak size before drought and during. Hopefully, what we can notice here is as the size of beak increases, you will notice that the total number of finches is actually increasing as the beaks get bigger. In other words, if you had a small beak, fewer finches survived. As we can see in the first few, there are none left here in this first category. There's only two out of 12 that are left in the next, four out of 30 in the next. But if we go to the last category, the biggest beak, there were 25 in the beginning, but now there's 10 still remaining, which is a really good survival rate when it comes to droughts. Now, don't get too caught up on the fact that these are all not the same numbers um, and the fact that the proportion of surviving or the percentage of each is going to be different because what I mean by that is because they're not all 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, and then we have a difference afterwards, don't worry about the fact that some are 30 and some are 48. That is how nature is, and so it is going to change how we need to work with these, but don't overthink this. This is not the hard part of this question. Rather, it is the application of your knowledge that's going to be the hard part. So let's get into our first question. Number one says, list four steps that scientists follow to, to obtain their results. Now, you're probably thinking, where is that? Like, where is that answer? What are these four steps that they followed to obtain their results? Well, this is why this question is tricky. You now have to think about what do you think they did in order to get these answers over here? Like, what do you think they could have done? Well, maybe the first thing they did is they measured the beak size, right? That is something that they would have need to have done. And so that's definitely a step um, they would have done to obtain their results. Another thing they would have measured is, didn't they measure the amount of finches before and after? In other words, they would have measured or they would have counted um, 
the before and the after. Another thing could they not do in terms of following steps is, didn't they decide on what bird they're going to use? So they decided on a species. And perhaps one other thing they decided on is the area that they did the test in. In other words, where did they go? They went to the Galapagos Islands. Now, again, I have created these answers based off of the information that I can get from the paragraph and from the table. However, it does require some thinking on your part. It's not just something that you can guess. It's not a comprehension question where you can just take the answers out of the paragraph. You can take the answers from the table, but you have to think about it a little bit, right? Like, how did they get the beak size values? How did they get the before and after values? And that is what they are asking you. And that is why sometimes these kinds of questions are a little bit higher ordered because we don't always synthesize new knowledge. It's one of the higher order questions that we do. And often we don't see it as a first question in an exam. Moving on to question two, it says, name the independent variable in this investigation. Now, there are a couple of ways you can find the independent variable. Um, the first and best way, the only way really you should be doing it, is you should be looking at the aim that we highlighted earlier here. Because the aim can only be written if you have the independent and the dependent variable. And if we look at this particular aim, it says to determine the relationship between beak size, that's one variable, and the survival of finches, that is another variable. Now, the independent variable here is the variable we are measuring, which means that's going to be beak size. We are seeing how does the beak size create survival? Or we can say it the other way, how does survival rely or depend on the beak size? And so beak is our independent variable, whereas the dependent variable would be how many survive, right? Like the, the value we don't know, we'd have to count it, we'd have to measure it, we'd have to see what happens. That one's pretty straightforward, and you should always take it from your aim. Moving on to the next question, it says, describe the relationship between the number of finches during the drought and the beak size. Now, a relationship, I want to clarify for everybody when we do these kinds of questions, is how one thing affects another. So in this instance, how does drought affect the size of the beak? So we've got to keep those two things in common when we talk about this answer. Now, if we look at the table, it's fairly obvious. As the size of the beak increases, right, as it goes up, the survival rate also increases. And so that is the relationship between the two. As the size increases, the survival increases. So that would be our answer. You could also give the opposite, which is as the size decreases, this would also be correct, survival is going to also decrease. Now, it's only for two marks, which means you are actually only getting a mark for saying the size and the survival. You don't need to elaborate any further. Moving on to our next question. It says, give a possible reason for the relationship in your answer. Now you need to actually substantiate yourself. And this is important to note the mark allocation. It's out of three. So your reason must have elaboration. It means you need to give detail about why is it that if the size increases, the survival rate increases. So let's remove this old answer here so we can write out our new answer. Now, let's think about natural selection and what the paragraph has told us. The paragraph has told us that during the drought, food has changed. And we need to mention that because that's ultimately why the beak size is changing. If you don't have the right beak, you can't survive. And so we need to acknowledge those things. So again, how am I going to prove that we have a large size, so size increases, and survival also increases, right? How am I going to explain those two points? So what I need to talk about is the environment. Now, because of the drought, food was reduced. 
right? Specifically, there was only the hard food left. Now, because there was only hard food left, only those individuals with the bigger beaks, right, they survived because they could eat. So the bigger beaks could eat. Because they could eat, they can survive, and they can pass on that trait to their offspring. And so what I've done here now is I have written more than three points, but essentially these are the key steps in your explanation. So why is, or what is the relationship as size increases, survival rate increases? Explain why. Well, because there was reduced amounts of food and there was more hard food available, those birds with bigger beaks could eat more or easier. They survived and passed on that trait. And that is how you need to frame it. You're actually applying your knowledge about natural selection, aren't you? Favorable and unfavorable. In this instance, it is a favorable trait to have a larger beak. The larger beaks survive, reproduce, and pass on to their offspring. And so all I'm doing here is I am applying my knowledge about the natural selection explanation to this situation. Now let's move into our last question. 3.4.5 says predict which beak size or sizes would be present in the population if the drought continued. Now, this is actually only for one mark, so it, uh, it actually doesn't require very much effort on your part. All you have to do is look at the table and predict what's going to happen next. If we look at the table, we can actually see that everything from about, let's say, 9.8 to 10.3 has a slightly better survival rate. But the beauty of this is it's actually a range of answers. If you said, for example, what would be the present beak size, saying 10.3 will get you the mark because that's the only one we can prove right now that has a good survival rate. But if you were looking at the table as a whole and you were trying to see who overall and you did a calculation for each and every one of them, you will notice that they actually take a range of answers. And so the range of answers can sit between these two numbers, maybe even a bit more. But I would say the safest bet is to give 10.3 because we know they have the best survival rate according to our table. Now, here is the official memo. You can have a look at it and you can mark your own work. In particular, I'd love for you to pay attention to 3.4.1's answers so you can see the variety of answers that you could have given. Um, a lot of them we already mentioned. Again, please remember they can only mark the first four because they asked for four. So please remember that don't list five or six and then hope for the best. Now, if you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and I will see you all again soon. Bye.